today's guest is Sasha Dents. She's one of these people that you meet from time to time who have such a broad range of knowledge and a huge heart. And they're able to integrate several different topics and themes into our current situation of how we're living today, what the problems and challenges are, and what the solutions can be. So there's no way to really describe the conversation you're about to watch other than please just watch it and enjoy. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. And um, in our little warm-up we just did, you talked mm -hmm. about um, if you focus just on the environmental challenges that we have, we might be mm -hmm. missing the point that there's something underneath that that's probably more important. Can we start there? Yeah. I think that it's very short-sighted and um, failing to understand the extent and degree of the crisis we're in. That the crisis we're in actually started about 500 years ago um, in a period that's called, some people call it, historians call it the pre-modern period. But actually it sort of began at that time. And, and if you don't understand that, if you don't understand what happened at that point, then everything you do is going to be kind of patchwork. It's going to be Band-Aid solutions. Um, but there's also a very powerful um, will not to understand it, not to know, not to know why we are the way we are. And also part of that problem is we don't know what we are. Like, we don't know how um, mentally ill or um, dysfunctional or potentially just sick our society is, and we as individuals are. So what began back then? Well... <laughs> Everybody knows their basic history. Um, probably the modern era began or in the in the 15th century. Um, that was the time when Columbus discovered the New World, when shipbuilding and and navigation skills were were sophisticated enough to get ships to places they had never been before, couldn't go before. There was that. There was also um, the emerging of the modern state with uh, the breakdown of Christendom. And Christendom, the, probably the last council they had, the Council of Basel, was in 1449. So you can kind of date that that was the last time when all of the bishops and all of the um, people who were involved in Christendom, the Christendom Project, which started 800 years before that, um, got together and said, what do we do? Which they had been doing yearly. And they never did it again after that. And so it was also a time of when the printing press was invented. So with that invention and, and um, the emerging of, of states, nation states, a whole bunch of things, and mercantilism, a whole bunch of things came together. But the thing that basically happened that's important to understand is what C.S. Lewis talks about. He said, in the pre-modern world, the task of being human, or the, or the main problem of being human, and the main understanding of being human was to adjust yourself from childhood on to reality. To make yourself disciplined, virtuous, which required enormous self-control, and to get enough knowledge and education, but not just of the head, but of what they would call the soul and the heart. Mm -hmm. And that was the project, to make yourself able to deal with reality, you know, and see, reality is the thing you adjust it to. What shifted at that time, is around the 16th century, was when people started to have inventions and discoveries and technology, they said, and it probably wasn't conscious or deliberate, but they said, why? Why can't I be, which is a dream that goes way back to Gilgamesh, why can't I use these new powers, really, in the service of myself? So what that project then became was how to adapt reality to us. How to change the natural world in particular, because, you know, up until then, nature had been the authority figure. Like, nature had been the one that says, look, this is what you do. Hmm. Hunger is a pretty powerful motivator for your behavior. Yep. And um, there was, I think, a deep resentment in human beings against nature. You don't like it. And against the transcendent, the lawgiver. 
Mm-hmm. So both those, sorry, just uh, just let me finish this part. Both those things that held ultimate authority before, they were reality. The transcendent God who gave moral strictures said, you cannot behave any way you want. There's a, there's a, it's written in stone, the Ten Commandments. Um, it's not something you can change arbitrarily at your will. Similarly, nature had authority. The ground was your boss. Mm-hmm. It told you how to behave. And your own biology mm-hmm. Also, you know, you couldn't do anything about it. It just was the way it was. Mm-hmm. So that all changed by the 15th century. There became the possibility, you no, know, we can change everything. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we've got to do is get rid of the authority there, down, and get rid of the authority there. And we can't do it immediately. We can't do it overnight because then people will go, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. This is terrible. This could go somewhere awful. Yeah. Right? And then we re- they would not let me do that. But Francis Bacon and Hume and Locke and um, Descartes, I mean, a bunch of people were writing and saying, um, they were all professed, still professed Christians because it was the water they swam in. But none of what they wrote referenced any transcendent authority. They subtly and in very, which is the scientific method is, Descartes articulated it. I see this. I observe this. I am the authority. Yeah, positivism in science yes. and validation exercise through sharing results, and you can replicate my results. Therefore, it's true. Um, might be mathematically true. And it's human-centered. True. Yeah, but it might not be spiritually true or connected to a universe true. You speak from a, um, a position so far on a, on a, how it's um, white. Um, religious-based, European-based. I'm curious, yes. do you have a similar or parallel narrative from the European expansion model and distancing from the self uh-huh. because of mechanization and modernization, uh, the role that money had to play in society? What about um, Turtle Island and First Nations long before um, um, Columbus and the rest came over here or the Norse came over before Columbus? Or do you have a... a Asian version of the same narrative? In China or, or Asia or yeah. Africa? Do, do they have equivalent stories? Because we tend to, as white people, speak from a certain history. Yes, that's what I, we, were, I we were taught. Yeah. So, so on a global scale, because um, environmental challenges will be global in scale, do those other geographic regions or philosophical regions or religious regions have their own narrative and and caught up almost in the same distancing from the self and from nature good question i i don't i can't say i'm i know chinese or asian or african history as well as i probably should but what i do know is no they did not introduce the machine age they did not have a, a sort of philosophical um and it was sort of it. It may have been indigenous to Western thought. I mean, it's classical and you know and Christian, but um, the why we need to focus on the Western model in a way is because through globalization, it's become the human model. Yeah, it's dominated the narrative globally. Yes. And and it has for a reason. I mean, what it did was say, look, uh, nature, your body, uh, God. These things have controlled your life. You've had to obey. You've had to be submissive. You've had to be willing to adapt and change yourself in order to fit. Now we're saying through technology, through thinking this way, uh, through all the things we can do, and boy, we can do a lot, just keep this optimism. was so. And everybody's had the human condition. Everybody's going, yeah. And not just for selfish reasons. You can say, well, you know, I can cure my wife or my son or my thing, or or I can do in agriculture what I couldn't do before, or I can manuf- through manufacturing, I can, mm. everybody can have a house, everybody can have clothes, everybody can. So there seems to be, um, especially with good ideas being mixed in with this uh, proclamation, um, something so, so incredibly seductive. And everybody gets on board. I mean, you know, already we have, the American dream has been outsourced and exported to the rest of the world, So, every, and everybody's got a screen of some description. It yep. doesn't matter how poor you are. My sister went to Kenya, and she went into what was called the middle class, 
which meant you sometimes had water, you sometimes had electricity. The water was never warm. That it was never the anyway. You know, yep. the, the drill. Yes, <laughs> but she said everybody had a screen, yeah. and they were always looking at our life. And they said, you know, what do I have to do? What do I have to change in order to be like them? And then you come here and you go, well, yeah, <laughs> right. Technology and <laughs> why, why do you want to be it's like been us? So, yeah, exactly. It's just so wonderful here, yeah. and that was the thing that they didn't understand. They didn't understand that even if you got rid of disease, even if you got rid of hardship, even if you got rid of some of the the things that really did press upon you, um, oppress you, that you wouldn't necessarily be happy. Hmm. But happiness is everybody's goal. Mm-hmm whether we admit it or not. <laughs> and so it's global. Yes. yes. Everybody's got on board for the Western project yep. in one description or another, yep. either has or wants to. And that ties us back to your beginning about the environmental challenges we have yep. that are connected to that gap that has a long history of how we've come to be in this place in this moment in time. Yes, exactly. So do you have some solutions or thoughts on directions, paths for where we can go? Is it is it reduction of capitalism and its impact on our society? Is it a different type of politics in our world that's not built on power as opposed to built on community? There's this lovely book called uh, The Book of Joy with um, Desmond Tutu and Dalai Lama. And their direction that they offer is happiness and community. Happiness and, and community. Yes. So yes. those are both invitations to like an energy plane as opposed to a mechanical, capitalistic, uh, generate wealth plane. Well, yes, I do have um, ideas. I don't have a solution. Um, the solution will initially be extremely painful for most of us. Um, and so, you know, you've got to be hesitant in offering it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a housewife. I'm just... I just look after kids and the home and my husband and sort of vaguely myself and this dog that's really, really annoying. <laughs> oh, if I'd known, <laughs> sold a bill of goods on that one. <laughs> no, I really love her, sort of, kind of. Anyhow, um, what I realized and seeing with my kids coming in all the time is that, yes, there's a whole bunch of movements. I mean, you can look at Capitalism, you can look at the Industrial Revolution, possibly, potentially, the worst thing that ever happened to us as a planet. The wound, the end all wounds. And the whole notion of revolution is, you know, embedded now in the, in the Western psyche. If you look at how we think and, and how we observe things, we say, revolution always needs a bad guy. Yeah. Right? Well, always it always needs to say, yes, it always says, we are right. We're the enlightened ones, and, and those over there, and we just have to, because we can't enlighten them fast enough, which we can't, yeah. we have to force a coup and change them. But power over is exactly what that modern entity wants us to be thinking in terms of, because it is power. I mean, C.S. Lewis talked about it as magic. He said, just as the old idea of magic was sort of waning, we got this new idea of magic, and it, it, we treat it as though it was magic. I mean, Christopher Marlowe in... Uh, God, I'll get to your questions. I promise I haven't forgotten. It's okay. Christopher Marlowe in Dr. Faustus. Uh, Dr. Faustus is seen as a modern uh, academic. He's, he's got all of these degrees. He's a scientist. He's a chemist. He's a botanist. He's, a, you know, he's got all of this wealth of knowledge. His IQ is off the scale. Hmm. Um, but it, isn't, it doesn't give him what he wants. It doesn't give him enough power. So that's when he makes this deal with the devil. And the, the, the play is so interesting because he does it as a modern man. Hmm. He said, I, I don't believe in you. Like, I know there's no such thing as the devil and hell and God and all that superstitious nonsense. At the same time, maybe I can use you. So Mephistopheles comes and says, whatever you want, so long as you sign right here. And uh, so he says, well, if I sign right there, you're going to give me what I want? He said, you've got 24 years, which if he was really, really bright, he would have seen as being like 24 hours, a temporary little piece of time before you can spend all of this time in agony. But of course, he justifies it by saying, this isn't real, but this is real. So anyhow, 
Christopher Marlowe said, we, we understood all of this knowledge and this ability as power. And when we think of it in terms of politics or we think of it in terms of um, uh, legislation or mm -hmm. doing things, I'm not saying those things are ineffective. I'm just saying that you can't change people's minds. Yeah. And it's very, and you antagonize a lot of other people. Yep. So, sorry. No, but to support that, because we're hedging into where does change come from. Um, Donella yes. Meadows, Donella Meadows does a lovely piece, maybe 15 years ago now, about, um, it's not tipping points in a system, but it's along that mindset. It's not Gladwell's stuff. Um, and she points out nine key indicators where change can come from. The weakest of which, or number nine, is numbers. So anybody using numbers to justify a change will be picking the, the weakest leverage point. So anytime you get pollsters telling you stats, anytime you get mm -hmm. sociologists doing demographic studies, they won't be indicators of change. They'll be indicators of something that came in the past or has happened and doesn't set you up for future shift. Mm -hmm. There's In the middle, there's positive feedback loops, negative feedback loops. So your taxes, people treat as a negative feedback loop. Positive feedback loop would be a reinforcement for a good behavior. Number one is heart. So it shifts to an emotional plane pretty quickly. And everything you're mapping out kind of wants to lead us to a happiness, community, um, revolution. But revolution doesn't necessarily need a boogeyman to go fight against. Paulo Freire in uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed talks about, um, in, I'll say it incorrectly, hegemony or hegemony? I'm sorry? Hegemony? Hegemony. Hegemony, yeah. thank you. Um, he'll talk about how the oppressors, um, be, uh, how the oppressed become the oppressors. Yes. So nothing Always. really changed, they just flip systems. Always. So it might be that in this window of time, this 20 year window from 2012 to roughly 2032, 20, there's a shift that's occurred and there's more and more exposure of corruption, more and more lack of tolerance in a population. They're more connected to each other. One of the benefits of social media change. So is it possible that the information age, which has kicked in now in full maturity compared to the mechanization age, industrial age, are there seeds planted there? If we can find our heart again? Yes, to, but you know, to, to be honest, on one hand, the global community that's formed through the internet is great. It's you know, and especially you know the the social movements you can feel like you're a part of just by pushing a button. Hmm. That's fantastic. However, it's not real. Hmm. And I guess to tell the truth, what I think will make change is how we treat our children. Hmm. That we take their emotional needs a lot more seriously than we do. We uh, prioritize education, and we prioritize professional success. And uh, from the cradle, we now do that for women too. So uh, we leave children for like eight or nine hours a day. And then in the remaining part of the day, say, well, we'll get our quality time in, um, and they'll somehow still be attached to us. They'll, be, they'll see us as the source of love and comfort. And, and um, having seen my my kids bring in all kinds of other kids, and even when the the families are sort of working, they're not working. There's an incredible amount of misery in us who have achieved the American dream, family breakdown. But the kids are in very very bad shape. Having you know taught for twenty years, I can say that a number of students and essays because I get es I got essays right, and what they were saying was. These are educated, well-fed, nutrition. Um, they have their vaccines. They've got mm -hmm. they. <clears throat> everything is is great. They are athletic. They know they have to exercise, and they're morally feral. They have no idea what uh, if I have to do the right thing. Hmm. Plato said, "To know the good is to do the good." What if you know the good and then find out in that moment, hey, I can't do the good. I don't have the moral muscle. I haven't developed the virtue hmm. to be able to do that. See, in the pre-modern world, the idea was a completely different understanding of being a human being. You, you uh, were born, and then, you, as I said, you adapted to reality. But the point was, 
You saw yourself as a biological part and a spiritual part, and the two come together to, to make this hybrid mongrel species. Um, but this was supposed to help this. By the biological thing, by disciplining the spiritual part of it, was to learn how to love in a way, um, through limits, through incredible limits, learn how to li love without limits, hmm. unconditionally. And then you'd be ready to be with God. Hmm. You could at least get in the front door. Because God was a love that was so unbounded and so limitless and so completely unhuman mm -hmm. that if you didn't have anything in common with that, I mean, and this goes with the uh, Tao, the way of the Tao, mm -hmm. then you, 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 you couldn't get together if there was nothing in you that was like that. So virtue was important. Virtue is what you need to do to do the right thing to learn to love. But it's not something you just have because you want it. <laughs> it needs to be developed. So we have these souls, as I was saying, that are flabby, that have never exercised mm -hmm. um, and never seen it as being something that's important. And mm -hmm. the education system is increasingly... I mean, when I started in 1983, we still had some notion, for example, in literature that teaching the great books was teaching wisdom. Wisdom is different from acquiring power through knowledge. Yes. <laughs> right? So getting tons of information and getting tons of knowledge makes you powerful. Mm -hmm. It does. And having a very, very high IQ makes you incredibly powerful. So we, we've been selecting for that. Mm -hmm. We haven't been selecting for this. Mm -hmm. Because this will say, no, you have to get small. You have to get minimal. You have to uh, get rid of the power you have. Because you can't be... Basically, what happened in the modern age is the human animal cannot be trusted with the kind of power it got. If, you, if I can refer to Lord of the Rings, uh, we can't have the ring. Even the best among us. The best among us know, like Gandalf said, you can't give it to me. I may begin to use it with, you know, virtuous intentions, with uh, altruistic hopes, but eventually. And that comes out of the idea of original sin, mm -hmm. that there's something in us that's human that it doesn't matter what we try to do that's good. Mm -hmm. We've tried utopian projects now for a, a while, eh? Mm -hmm. I mean, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, well, you know, we can look at them, Third Reich. These were attempts at saying, we can create heaven on earth just through social engineering and uh, our, our own big, huge brains. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the modern human being is. It's focused on the brain. A, f a fleshy machine with a big brain. Yeah. So that model is now supplanted the idea of the soul and the body. Yeah. And this big brain will dominate biology, just like it will dominate ecology. Mm -hmm. It will get rid of the parts it doesn't like and change the parts it wants and use parts as a kind of life support system for this big brain that it likes. So, to answer your question, to come back to that, and I'm sorry that no, this is I think it begins good. on the ground. I think it begins with us saying, no, I will get rid of what I, the luxury. I will get rid of all of the incredibly unbelievable historical, it's just over-the-top magnitude of excess that, that, that we live in. And it's really hard to do. Like, it's just like it's, you're participating in it when you, even when you don't want to. Um, and then there's part of you that wants to. Of course there is, because, and this is another important point, it's pre-modern suffering. Suffering was accepted mm -hmm. because you didn't have much choice, but also because it was seen as useful. It helped in this project of becoming virtuous, of loving everybody and everything. Without suffering, you can't do that. It can't happen. So it had it was purposeful suffering. So the three, what I call the three S's, suffering, sacrifice, and service, were the goal. And it's so that when you knew the right thing, you could do the right thing. Um, of course, those three things are forbidden. If you mention the value of suffering, hmm. <laughs> Yep. No, we just but, get rid of it. But isn't it ironic, as part of our national narrative right now, and it's an ad campaign running through mainstream media, um, but you can find it a lot of other places, that food security is a major issue in this country. And the ad will talk about 4 million people in Canada suffer from food challenges. 
They can't access good, healthy food. Four million people at a time when we're supposedly at a peak of all of the benefits of all the technology and all the energy that's gone on before. Yeah. So our embracing suffering, I mean, it's still there, <laughs> you know. There, there's all kinds of it around, but, I know, but our, per- of our it. perception of it is radically different. Yes. And how we distance ourselves yes. from it is radically different. It's there to be fixed. Yeah, as opposed to embraced. And, yes. And that's a whole other energy. Exactly, exactly. Because the point here now, if, again, if I can refer to this modern project, is to have an enjoyable time here on Earth hmm. for as long as possible, hmm. to maximize happiness here. And then, like Dr. Faustus, what comes after, there's nothing after, right? Hmm. It doesn't matter what we do. We're not going to be held to account. Hmm. There's no authority no authority anymore in the earth that's imposing anything, and no authority that's transcendent that we will then answer to. Mm-hmm. So if you get rid of those authorities, it was kind of, what it was kind of like was a teenage rebellion. In 14th century, 15th century, sorry. <laughs> we kind of said no to the two parents mm-hmm. that we had, the planet earth and God. Said, uh-uh. And they could legitimately look at the way that that was revealed with, you know, in the church and in, and in the monarchy and all the rest of it as corrupt because, you know, they were, they were people. Wherever you have people, <laughs> it doesn't matter how good or virtuous something is, mm-hmm. it eventually becomes somebody in any way is going to be corrupt. So they, that is always an excuse to then say, we're going to get rid of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. now the idea is to, is to live here now as best you can. I don't care about where you're going because you're not going anywhere um and that's so radically different that's such a change how do we change our mindset to something resembling what it was before yeah or or integrating from other cultures because some of that echoes or has resonance with first nations or native culture yes some of that has uh, resonance with Taoism. yes no matter where you go there you are you know uh, the energy of being present and yeah. feeling that connection with being present and allowing transcendence or shifts to occur under those conditions as opposed to, um, I have a goal, I'm going to map up my four-year business plan, and I'm going to attain my goal, which is all power-based, um, ego-driven. Yes. So your invitation is to look at economies, political systems, environmental systems, not as how we've always done it for four or 500 years, but... And knowing that here is a way we need to shift in order to give our children and grandchildren something a bit better than the mess we've created. But what it means for individuals is I'm going to have to give up that job to be with these kids. Because human beings, one of the facts of biology, have this incredibly long childhood. <laughs> right? They do now. We are dependent. <laughs> you know, it's getting even longer in yeah. a way. And that's, again, irony. The more modernized we get the, the weaker we get yeah, instead of stronger well well isn't there one of the storylines i'm thinking of before in around world war one there was no notion of a teenager mm-hmm. somewhere in and around world war ii there was the beginnings of a notion of a teenager now when applying for government dollars most any places a youth will be 29 and under <laughs> yeah you need so much education yeah like you know I don't know, everybody's kids, like they have like two, three, four degrees, like, or, or, or certificates, you know, that re- you need to have so much, and then you need experience, which means you need to volunteer. And it's incredibly expensive, hmm. unbelievably expensive. Hmm. And so only a tiny few. I mean, the problem with the, the education system that we have is that it's starting in kindergarten, you said, well, you're groomed to become an academic. The successful ones are the ones who can acquire this vast amount of knowledge because they have this IQ and they, they're able to do it successfully. They also have the work ethic. Um, they're the ones who are going to be successful, and they are. And they're going to have careers, men and women, who do that. Um, the rest of you, uh, you're going to have to just adapt to this. This is the new normal. And uh, the essays I've gotten, you know, the kids who are suicidal. I am not an academic. I must be an academic. I have to be an academic, but I'm not an academic. I'm inferior because I'm not, I don't have a above average IQ. I just don't, I can't convince my parents of that because they know that to get that job. Instead of saying to them, look, 2% of you will have careers. The rest of you will have jobs. Historically, jobs are just paid the rent. 
if you've had them, mm -hmm. and what's made life meaningful are people and music yeah. and art and get-togethers and children and doing the hard labor of reality yeah. and then seeing what virtue looks like because it shines in the dark. Yeah. It's when you see somebody who's virtuous and they're so rare that you go, oh yeah, that was worth it. It was worth it. But we have to then say, I have to give up this. I have to give up that. I have to accept my biology. I mean, because the feminist revolution just adopted the same uh, script. It just said, well, you know, we're going to be powerful and knowledgeable. And yeah, some women have more testosterone than other women. And those women were the ones with high IQs. So they're the most educated, the most articulate. They were the one that said, uh, passed policy and got things going. They said, you and all of you other women are going to be like us. That's dandy if these women really were like that. But unfortunately, because of biology, our children need somebody to be there. I mean, what I've seen, sorry, I'm just going to keep going. What I've seen with um, kids who are not supervised, hmm. you know, uh, teenagers who are not supervised, they really don't have the impulse control and, and self-control of adults. They just don't have it. Plus, they're surrounded with images and beliefs and ideas that says endless amounts of happiness and pleasure are just awaiting you if you push this. So what my kids are told is that they're all drinking, they're all hooking up, they're all taking various forms of drugs. There's a line of drugs out there that are absolutely unbelievable, new ones they keep bringing up every... Um, they're getting STIs, they're, they don't, there's no such thing as the future. And they're doing it because there's nobody on the ground. Just physically being in the home with the kid is an inhibiting presence. Even if I don't do share any wisdom or shape anybody's virtue, or, or, or but they also, when you're there, they talk to you. Mm -hmm. And a big part of being, parenting human beings, is just letting them talk and talk and talk and endlessly talk. And then coaching, that's your job, yeah. but it's a job. And you cannot have a career. Careers demand your all. They are 80 hour weeks. They will suck up all everything you've got. Yep. And you want that because if you've got the career and you've got more testosterone costing money, I want that status. Career equals ego. Hannah Arendt said a lot about career in uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem. She said, no, the next threat for the modern world is not totalitarianism. The next threat is careerism. And women just bought right into that. <laughs> it, this could, but isn't it interesting how the, the notion of the divine feminine and the sacred male have disappeared? And that would be a path in nurturing young people to help make them aware of the sacred in themselves, whether it's divine feminine or sacred male, mm -hmm. which could help build the bridge. But it sounds, not Pollyanna, but it sure doesn't sound like a practical strategy for addressing, you know, the challenges that we have. But there's a certain number of us that really believe mm -hmm. that the key to the shifts that we need to take on a very large scale will not be pragmatic. They're going to be emotional. And with that emotional base will come a connection that you didn't have before. A Czech psychiatrist called uh, Alice Miller, I'm sure you've heard of her. She wrote a, a seminal book called The Gifted Child, or the Something of the Gifted Child. I never read it. But anyway, her premise was that what happened in Germany was the result of what she called poisonous pedagogy, which was a kind of uh, child-rearing practices that began in the 19th century in Europe, uh, which used extreme amounts of cruelty to get children to behave in a certain way. A certain. So she said that normalized cruelty because what you grow up with is the way life is, right? Like that's mm -hmm. just, and she said then it didn't, it didn't come as uh, an aberration. They didn't, they didn't reel in shock when as adults or as young as teenagers, Hitler's youth, they were told, well, we need to be cruel to all of these unfit people. Um, so it was because they were, you see what happens with child rearing is that you are preparing the unconscious of a child. The thing he does when he doesn't know why he do, does it. Mm -hmm. The knee-jerk reactions. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if you're not responsive in there and loving him and saying, even though you're weak and dependent and completely unfit, 
to be in this adult world, I'm still here. And he says, I want you. Why do I want you and not your substitute? Well, she's better trained than she is. Because I was in your body. Hmm. Your smell, the sound of your voice. Uh, these are familiar. Familiar means safe. When you're weak and, and unfit, safe is a lot. And completely dependent. The modern world loathes dependency. Sorry, this is great. About language. Dependency versus interdependency. Yes, versus independence. It's interesting to see the etymology, I mean, how language has changed. For now, for example, the word strong means good. Hmm. We talk about somebody's strengths and weaknesses. We don't talk about what's good in them or not so great. Uh, strong is not good. Hmm. Weak can be very good. Hmm. And that's what we have to choose. If we want things to change, we have to consciously and deliberately choose to self-efface and accept the, the discipline of the body, of biology, because there's a theology of the body in the sense that if you bring in your idea of the sacred female and the sacred male, um, the sacred is already in nature. It's also transcendent. It's both. Um, if we obey the body, the biology of the body will take us from selfishness to selflessness. If it, it will say, you know, I mean, we all experience this as a parent. When we became a parent, we go, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> no, no way. I can't be pr constantly prioritizing this person who, who gives me nothing. I mean, an intellectual conversation is zip. You know, all I have to do is deal with is faces and, and snot. And, no, no. Okay. And I have to, and, and I don't sleep for nine weeks. And it's fun the first time. You start hallucinating and you make jokes. <laughs> but eventually you, you don't think it's funny at all. And you don't, and you go, I can't, I remember when I, the, when the, when I had the second baby lying there going, this cannot be expected of me. <laughs> no, I don't know who to complain to. There must be a, a customer service board yeah. somewhere. But I quit. This yeah. job, this job is no good. It demands so much self-denial. Mm -hmm. Constantly putting yourself on ice, mm -hmm. and it's horrible. There's wasn't, no getting around it. Wasn't liberating. Hmm? Wasn't liberating. It wasn't joy. It wasn't fun. And I wanted to go back to work. I wanted because what you get at work is so much aff affirmation. Huh. All eyes trained on you. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, I am an authority. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're sitting there going, and you, and it's yeah. it's. it's so hard to break the ego. Yes, but you're being wonderful in sharing what it was like for you in raising your children. But we mm -hmm. started down that path because we need to nurture children along a different method or way or heartfeltness or creating that safe space mm -hmm. so that when they get to be older, they actually have real connections with yes. other people. And the only way you can have real connections with other people is if you've been loved enough. And loved means is a practical thing. It's not an, a feeling. As Dostoevsky put it in uh, Brothers Karmazov, love sounds like a dream, and it sounds like a, a, and it can be sometimes a wonderful feeling, but he said love in action is harsh. It's horrible. It's awful. You will hate it. And that's what we did. We got rid of love. And because we don't like it, God isn't love. We don't want that. And it's demands on us. It's demanding on us. It's telling us. But if we don't, if we don't meet those demands, then the conscience does not grow, does mm. not develop. Mm. Because you extrapolate from I was loved, and my feelings mattered. Mm. My needs mattered, even though I had nothing to give. Therefore, other people's needs matter. The earth's needs matter. Mm. Children are automatically in touch with animals in the earth. They talk to each other. Yeah. So they go, oh, yes, of course. Of course. Well, that'll nurture the interdependence of the parts. Exactly. The interconnectionness, the knittingness. We don't have a lot of time to do this, but <laughs> I don't know any fast, quick cure. Yeah. It's going to be us doing what we don't want to do as a species yes. across the planet. And we can help each other with the pain of it. Part of the problem with being doing this is you're alone when you're doing it. You know, I remember one time uh, sitting in the kitchen crying when I had the third child. And, I, and he had ADD, and uh, no, I, yeah. <laughs> um, and this friend of mine who had, was, had 
bipolar disorder, she said, Sasha, you have no idea how blessed you are. You have a husband, you have three healthy children. Yes, he's got ADD, but, you know, yeah. this is nothing. You, you, and I said, yeah, but I have MS. And she said, you cannot complain. You have no idea the suffering I have having nobody and nothing. But that, that having nobody and nothing is exactly what the modern project wants you to be. Alone, autonomous, independent, self-sufficient, and needing no one. And that's not human. Sorry. Meanwhile, no. Meanwhile, following that tack is the planet needs us, and we don't have a relationship with it anymore. Or the relationship we have with her is is not necessarily the best one for her. So, is there a connection for you between how we treat each other and then, in turn, how we treat our planet? Exactly, because if it, again, if it begins with pre-language, before you've got these, you know, cerebral ideas going on. It's automatic. Hmm. And children already have, hmm. uh, you know, you know, you put them outside within f less than 30 seconds, they're covered. <laughs> <laughs> Their yeah. whole body is covered. And, you know, they see the pet and launch, yeah. right? The, the, the bugs in the house, infestations of, <laughs> yeah, creatures that come in and are kept in places. <laughs> you don't, ah! Yeah. Yes. So there's nothing sanitary about a child. You know, and that's the reality because they don't want to be. They're automatically invested. So by nurturing them, you're teaching them that this, this interdependence, as you put it, before the pre-modern world, there were three ways to be human. The male way, and I'm not going to denigrate the male way. The male way was the testosterone way. And what I, I've told, you know, Margot endless times, the thing that needs to be really understood about male biology is the amount of testosterone that get they hit with at puberty. If you understand the biology of it, you go, of course. I'll let you have your status. You need it. You know, I'll let you have your ego. You have to have it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do what you're doing without it. Um, I'll let you have your drive, and we'll channel it in constructive ways in the service of this other project, which is called life. Yeah. And then there was the second way, which was being female, and she was like in touch with that, and she was in touch with this. So she was kind of a bridge between mm -hmm. the male way of being human, and then the third way was the child. And the child's way of being human was so close to the earth and the spirits of the earth. Yes. The souls of the earth. Yes. Um, and to get to your idea of the of the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine and the sacred earth, all of this was supposed to be a community, the non-human and the human. Mm -hmm. And to some extent it was in the pre-modern world. I mean, when we look at history, we can see what they were doing at the top, right? The wars, the crusades, all the rest of it. But people on the ground, they had a priest and they had a village and the Benedictine monks who lived lives of intense self-denial had cultivated Europe and such that's why Europe was so successful they had food production down cold they said, this is how you work with 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 nature you have um, crop rotation you have ways of respecting nature mm -hmm. and loving those limits mm -hmm. because they're shaping you and nature had so anyway there was this this interdependence and interrelatedness and they and they as with Aboriginal people it was literal like, as, just as <laughs> Aboriginal peoples, many of them, I, I had my daughters like this, can see spirits, yes, actual spirits, yep. and see the spirits in nature. Yep. They see the spiritual dimension, the transcendent dimension, if you like, too. Yep. Um, we no longer can. We have dumbed ourselves down. Yep. Just as we're flabby morally, we're spiritually stupid. Um, and there's so much we cannot. We simply are blind, literally. But children, if they're raised like this, if they're allowed to be children, they're allowed to be dependent, will automatically permit the needs and restrictions and limits of everyone else to be prioritized. The interconnection between people, um, which can invite, uh, if you want to go metaphysics with it, is about the energy waves here and the energy auras around people. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to blank on her name right now, but there's this great video clip by this professional female who does like a TED talk lecture um, talking about the vibration rates around your body and in our right. ability to be aware of those vibration rates around your body. So as an example, she might say, you know, when you're walking through the woods 
and you ducked and you ducked before you saw where the tree branch was, that was an awareness that humans have that we have lost touch with. Similarly, the human heart mm -hmm. is 50 times more powerful than the human brain for its awarenesses. They can measure this now. So she'll talk about human hearts all in this room are all aware of each other already the second they walk in the room. It's whether mm -hmm. or not you can no, tap that, into that and be yeah. aware of it. And then to reinforce that with a physics model, she'll talk about there's a guitar in this side of the room and a guitar in that side of the room. The two guitars are tuned to each other. Mm -hmm. Pluck the D string on this guitar, that D string will mm -hmm. resonate. That's me. Similarly, your heart, like the guitar, once it mm -hmm. starts to find resonance with other people, yeah. But the premise is you have to be in tune yes. <laughs> with your own heart yes. in the first place. Yes. So she maps out in her way where uh, Dr. Sue Mortar, that's her name. She maps out in her way where a breakthrough can occur in a large political system or in a large economic system. But that wants to tap in together with Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu when they talk about community and happiness. Because there in those conditions, the heart is joyful. That's yeah. why it's called the Book of Joy. Yeah. And you're mapping out, uh, here's some paths, you know, which would create the foundation through the next generation with huge shifts in economy, which means we're treating our environment better. Because that's how we started, was talking about what do mm -hmm. we do about the environment and how do we get there? Well, I talk about the environment, but I also want to talk about what's happening to our social environment. You know, when 48% of kids don't have fathers... Mm -hmm. they, be, they begin life already at risk. Missing half the energy. Yeah, yeah. so that's half the population mm -hmm. who start um, w with the financial and emotional and um, spiritual um, de deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that all came out with uh, these movements mm -hmm. that really gained momentum in the 60s in a way. Um, and they... <laughs> The hard thing about it is, again, we can say, well, for example, with the liberals, we have the environmental prior the environment prioritized, and we know that there's a crisis there. We're not going denying it, you know, or something like that. We also prioritize the needs of women, and we make sure that they're free from violence and all that kind of. Um, but we children, children will, and then there was the gay rights thing, you know, we, 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 they're no longer they need to be free from oppression. Of course, they do. And oppression, though, was seen as the model. <clears throat> Over here, we have people saying, no, we got to strengthen the family. We have to, you know, go back to the way things, we have to strengthen tradition. And tradition is the way things were always done. Yes. Right? The, the roots that we had from 1,500 years of Christianity, yeah. really. And there were some incredibly good things in there, in our tradition. But the whole thing, you just have to say the word religion, <laughs> and the room was cleared, and understandably, mm -hmm. you know, understandably. But we, because we box things in language and rhetoric in a certain way, mm. and we we understand it that way. When you're talking about this, you're talking about that. So we got to get these two together. Do we need a new language? And I think it's to be a language that's that's Aboriginal, but I don't want to reject the male model or the European model either, mm -hmm. or the Western model, mm -hmm. because it was very male. Mm -hmm. But it was extremely, it has some incredible benefits. Mm -hmm. It's just the problem was, I like it, you know, as is its sort of imperative, it took off. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, the Hindu model, which it, that was the one that converted me to, to vegetarianism, um, where, you know, the spirits and souls of animals need to be respected, and we have to understand what's happening to animals. So in terms of the environmental crisis, to bring it back to what you were saying, it's not that these all these crises are interlocked, and what has to happen is, on the basis, deal with them all, which is we have grown-ups who, how can they be moral? How can they be um, emotionally mature? How can they have virtue and, and, and do without and get rid of their excess? And, and lose it, how can they do that when they were never loved? Hmm. Is when I was bringing in Alice Miller, I was trying to say it starts here and it ends there. You start with a kid who's hit uh, be, while he's being toilet trained, and then you've got someone who joins Hitler Youth, and on it goes as a prison guard in a camp. 
if we don't understand that, that human beings are biological creatures, and that's as important as ecology, and go back to some sort of obedience to biology, then I think we're doomed. But what, we, what human beings need biologically is love. And they need it first, at least, from one person. And if we prioritize that, <coughs> I, I think we would have a grassroots revolution or evolution where if everybody, if all children were allowed to be loved, allowed to be dependent, allowed to be with their mothers, and then when they didn't want to be with their mothers, allowed to develop past that in ways, but not put into a school system which says, this is how you have to be going to be a successful human being. Hmm. And the only thing we're going to prioritize here is your cerebral development. Right, that's the only thing that matters to us now. I mean, in the past, you could say well, <coughs> the, the muscle was literal muscle, yep. and women couldn't participate in that upper body strength and all that. But this one, the cerebral muscle, women can participate in, and they've just joined in, yep. because it does mean freedom from all of that hands-on guck, either in the earth or with animals or with children. Mm-hmm that mothers and fathers necessarily, if they're doing the job right, must prioritize and put ahead of their own desires, the head of their own. And the problem with being brought up, when you get a PhD, I don't want to talk to children, especially if they're younger than three. Maybe your PhD is in working with children. Exactly. <laughs> That's the problem, though. And then this person, because I saw it in, in, the, in academia, you know, they, they, very few of them had children. And the ones that did, someone else was raising them. And they, I remember one of them talking to me and saying, well, they called the nanny mom. And I said, well, why wouldn't they? Yeah. Why yeah. wouldn't they? And then that person is going to leave. So they've got this profound grief inside them, which they have to squash. Yep. So the whole system rips apart. I mean, there was a centrifugal movement with modernity which is to tear apart, atomize reality into fragments and bits, tear apart communities, tear apart families, tear apart couples, tear apart the interior part of it, and say there's only one thing that matters is this big brain and that which supports it. Yep. Because the successes could hardly be argued with. So going back to the emotional needs of children for me is how we change the world. Because they are not going to want to destroy the environment when they're adults. This is an excellent place to start. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was an amazing conversation. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for letting me spill it. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for watching. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.